Greetings, brothers and sisters. This is Alejandro Mercas. Mercas? I don't know. He's speaking. He's doing a. He's in a committee for Homeland Security, and he dropped this little bombshell. Uh, we have just established a mis and disinformation governance board in the. The Illuminati will see you now. What? <laughs> They've established a misinformation and disinformation governance board. A mis and disinformation governance board in the Department of Homeland Security to more effectively. Um, combat uh, this threat, not only to election security, uh, but to our homeland security. We are disseminating information uh, to the secretaries of state. We are counseling them. So they're saying this about Russia, but they're liars. Right? <laughs> like these guys are proven liars and proven disinformation agents. And, you know, they can say it's about anything, right? They can make an excuse about something that everyone would agree on, right? Most people would say, all right, we don't want Russia spreading lies in the United States that undermine our government and undermine our whatever it is. I would agree with that, right? We don't want a foreign government, you know, putting out disinformation that would undermine our election security or any of these things. That's something we could all agree on, but that's not the real reason why they're putting out this addition to our government. We know that not to be true because there's this idea out there that the truth community was somehow started by Russia and Russia today, right? That people who have been doing this now since um, 2001, it's been a presence on the internet. But my brother, you know, people like him, he came back from Vietnam and there was a small group of disgruntled, uh, you know, Vietnam vets and other people who had been doing this for years. It existed in um, on AM radio and in like underground newsletter, various types of alternative um, narratives to the mainstream media and the mainstream government talking points. It existed on the right, the so-called right, and existed in the hippie movement, this idea of you know the government lying. And the government's lied, and like you'll get so many movies I mean, there's an alien invasion. The first thing the government does is cover it up, right? Puts out disinformation. You know, there's an asteroid about to hit the Earth and they don't want people to panic or whatever their excuse is and they decide not to. And, I'm, you know, that's a legitimate excuse because people, you know, we see what happened with uh, COVID at, you know, the grocery stores and people went out and bought toilet paper, right? You know, withdrew cash. I mean, there was a you know, run on the banks. I mean, people panic and they think they're looking out for themselves, but they can cause the system to collapse. So it's not like that's not a real thing, but it happens over and over again. The government withholds information or puts out, you know, lies, you know, this idea of obscurantism and the heartfulness meditation, you know, the whispers of the brighter world video uh, messages, obscurantism. It means that, you know, People in control of the system who lie and, you know, put out all kinds of fake information or withhold information in order to control their subjects, right? This has, you know, been going on for centuries. Uh, but now they're having this disinformation network and they're saying it's about Russia. But we know, you know, all of us know that Russia isn't responsible for this organic movement that's happening in America and other places around the world, right? Where People no longer believe the official story and are putting out more realistic narratives. Biden blasted for policing free speech with dystopian disinformation bureau. Are ripping the Biden administration after it announced it was setting up a disinformation governance board. Sounds like something from 1984, right? Well, it's supposed to combat misinformation ahead of the midterms. Person headed heading it, a woman named Nina Jankowitz. Jankowitz, <laughs> I had a friend who, um, he was always uh, like saying, he had a friend named Jeskowitz. Like one time we were in a bar and some guy walked by us and he said, take it easy, Jeskowitz, right? <laughs> he, he was always talking about Jeskowitz, so uh, I have a reference point. Jankowitz called Hunter Laptop a Trump product. All right, this is a person who denied the Hunter Biden laptop, right? And so, you know, that's a sense of disinformation. The whole 
Hunter Biden crack thing, right? She is a Russian disinformation expert who cast doubt on the New York Post reporting about Hunter Biden's laptop. She suggested it was, quote, a Trump campaign product. Anyway, so this person is, you know, been discredited before even taking office or taking this position. Disarming disinformation, our shared responsibility. This is um, all to do with this. Um, there is the truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and responsibility as citizens, as Americans, especially as leaders, leaders who have pledged to honor our Constitution and protect our nation to defend the truth and defeat lies. This is a quote from this guy. We're going to seize their yachts, their luxury homes, and other ill-begotten gains of Putin's kleptocracy. Yeah. Kleptocracy and klep the guys who are the kleptocracies. <laughs> <laughs> but these are bad guys. This legislative package strengthens our law enforcement capabilities. So this guy, right, he barely is conscious. Um, and he lies all the time. And so it started, his first big lying scandal started in 1987 when he ran for president. Joe Biden's first presidential run in 1988, created after mid multiple instances of plagiarism. He took a guy's speech, a guy from England's speech, and he, you know, lied about what his family members did in terms of work, and but he's had a long history of lying, which CNN itself covered. Speculation about his presidential no aspirations for their trust. Like his strange hold on Defense Secretary Ash Carter's wife, Stephanie, and this claim about Somali immigrants in his hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. It's a large, very identifiable Somali community. There's an awful lot of driving cabs uh, and, uh, and our friends of mine, for real. I'm not, I'm not being solicitous. I'm being serious. And no, he's lying. And it turns out factually incorrect. Only 15 Somalis live in the entire state, according to the Census Bureau. And Wilmington cab drivers told CNN they knew of no Somalis driving taxis. No one is asked to respond to. So Joe Biden, this was a hit piece CNN did when they wanted Hillary Clinton as the candidate for president, right? And this was and Joe Biden was going to challenge her. He was then vice president. Um, and so they, he didn't run because he knew that they were against him, but they had no time. They, they had no trouble pointing out the way that he snoozled and groped people. And this is a whole hit piece that CNN did, but they forgot about all this stuff. Everybody did, you know, Jojo Magoo, this meme that I have of Jojo Magoo saying I've been dumb is about his plagiarism in 1987. I'll play that here. I've done some dumb things, and I'll do dumb things again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've been dumb. So after he got caught lying multiple times, and CNN did a hit piece on him, and everyone let him know they didn't want him to run for president because they've chosen Hillary, he said he went and did this. And by the way, when I left the vice presidency, I had a chance to do a number of things, but I became a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, presidential politics. And I, uh, it was, uh, I, I enjoyed it, but it's hard. That's the other thing people don't realize. It's hard. Yeah, it wasn't a real position. It was like an honorary position, so it's a lie, right? The guy's constantly lying, you know? <laughs> and he's lying now, he's lied then, he's lied his whole career. And they all lie, but he's a particularly bad liar because he gets caught. He tells stupid, foolish lies, right? Campaign press release, copy that Joe Biden's long record of plagiarism. On Biden's plagiarism scandal, why he deserves to win, Joe's an honest guy. He's an honest guy. I mean, he's just been somebody who lies his whole career. He's a liar. He gets caught in lies all the time, and now he makes factual mistakes, whether he's lying or he has dementia. It's hard to say. But this guy is somebody who is, you know, a complete liar, right? I mean, somebody that everything that he says is questioned because he's always saying stuff. I'm not being salacious or whatever it is, right? No, I'm being serious. I'm telling you the truth. You know, like he says that all the time because that's what liars say. Biden admits plagiarism in school, but
but he says it was not malevolent. So he was, um, when he was in college, he also plagiarized paper. He's a plagiarizer, right? Steals people's speeches, steals their ideas, plagiarizes his work in school, copies people's paper, right? And now he's putting out a, you know, disinformation with this person who called Hunter Biden's, um, Hunter Biden's uh, laptop, uh, you know, a Trump product, when we all know now it's been confirmed that it is Hunter Biden's laptop, where he has a crackhead son who had all these inappropriate business dealings with um, foreign governments, and Jojo Magoo was implicated in them in one way or another. And so this guy, who has bad character, right? He's somebody who isn't a person with good character, now has a disinformation governance board. And they're saying it's all about Russia, but we know that this is going to be used against the American people at some point. It was inevitable. Because, you know, when your story is a lie, when you're a liar, and I'm not talking just about the Democrats, I'm not talking about just Joe Biden or his people, I'm talking about all of it, right? When you're, you know, you're a liar and you're running a deceptive game, you have a Ponzi scheme, you know, when you can't produce or deliver you're on your promises and your, you know, your reality that you're pitching, your narrative is a complete lie, then you have to control the information. You have to control anything that's going to uncover your, you know, your deception, right? And this was inevitable. Like when the internet started, there was like an infusion of alternative media, alternative, you know, opinions and alternative um, information that was away from the mainstream story, the official story. And at some point, it was going to need it needed to be brought back in. And this is what they're doing here. We all knew it. Eventually, this was going to happen. All right, so just um, to go with this, I want to come back to the JoJo Magoo thing in a moment. Here's the five top. Here's the five laptop reveal that GOP will want Joe and Hunter Biden to explain. You know, there's all this stuff on Hunter Biden's laptop has never been answered for. Like it doesn't exist. It was investigated. The FBI had it. I mean, this could be something that's flirts with treason, right? Buying influence with the vice president and now the president with foreign governments and his crackhead son. This is a monster scandal. This is, you know, one of the biggest, I mean, this is bigger than Watergate. This is a huge scandal. Should be national news. And Jojo Magood should be on the hot seat. It just shows you that there's no journalism. There's no truth. I mean, the New York Post is considered sort of a a rag, right? Not a, a legitimate paper. And because of their right leaning, uh, the right leaning ways, they are you know the only ones covering this, and they were blocked on Twitter. Remember, their account was suspended for posting this stuff that turned out to be true. Tweeter. I'm in the editing process, and I did a voiceover on the at the end of this video, and I would add this to the voiceover, but I'm going to put it in here because I don't know, you know, I have to find the right place to put it. It's just a, a hassle, right? And oftentimes it just doesn't flow with what I'm saying in the voiceover. See, you grew up with, we all grew up with a certain perception of America. You know, America as an ideal, idealistic version of America in the world and people in general. You're given this, you know, information about, I mean, uh, like not information, but, uh, you know, uh, these archetypes and these um ideals of heroic and patriotism and these people who the founding fathers and then what America is about and all the great Americans and all the great things about America. And it's backed up by the lifestyle. It's backed up by beautiful buildings and being able to fly and, you know, progress that's happening and more and more cool gadgets that we use and lifestyle just getting better and better. And then the internet and all these things, right? This is like when you look at somebody's Facebook page, that's the brand, right? That's the image that people want you to see. When you look at somebody's resume, right? When somebody goes in for an interview and they say all the places they've worked and they try to back it up with references and, you know, yeah, I'm not a liar. Actually, there's people who will vouch for what I'm saying here in my interview and my resume. 
in the way people present themselves in the interview, in the way the company presents themselves to you, you know, and how great it is to work there, right? You're both lying, right? <laughs> you know, the person getting the job more than likely is, you know, they're doing it for money and, I mean, they don't like the work or whatever it is. And the place itself is exploiting you. And you're both lying. You're both pretending to be better than you are, right? And it happens in relationships. But you have these fundamental building blocks in the case of America and your way of perceiving America. And those building blocks, you know, were there when you were a child, there when you were, you know, two, three, four, five years old, right? All the way up through your childhood. And so you are much more innocent. And it's almost like, it's not almost like you become a child when those building blocks are, you know, are somehow um, in jeopardy of being uh, disputed inside your internal world. When you get information about what the system really is, right, it's like these building blocks that you've had are now being like, oh, they're being ripped away from you. And so most people have a very difficult time in reconciling that and allowing the building blocks to be removed. For me, being dyslexic and just, you know, having a, like a spiritual uh, past lives and things, whatever I came in with, I really didn't buy into the system in different ways. And, you know, even though it, it sucked for me, just everything, like being an American, it was frustrating for me. But it wasn't as hard for me then to see all the, like, the bad side that we're now seeing, right? See, when you're dealing with people, they have a good side, right? They have their spiritual side. They have their good character qualities. And then they have their bad side and their selfishness. And, you know, it comes out in marriages. You know, there's this big Johnny Depp divorce, which is, you know, <laughs> like everyone wants me to cover it. I just haven't been able to look into it, right? I get so many comments that people want me to cover it. I know a little bit about it. You know, but there was a time where Amber Heard and Johnny Depp thought each other were great, great enough that they married, they married, at least, you know, that's the official story. And that's what people have, right? How many people have idealized somebody and loved them and were, you know, betting their entire life and their child rearing on marrying that person. And then things go south and that person becomes like the worst person in the world, right? You know, they went from someone you idealized to somebody that is now the worst person, somebody that you loved and you thought the world of. And then, you know, now they're like the person you hate the most, right? And anybody who's been through a bad divorce um, sees this. And oftentimes when you're going through that process of the idealization of a person to where they become a villain to you, there's a process where you, you see their good qualities and the things that attracted you to the person, and then you see the bad qualities that were hidden. And you, you know, you say, all right, maybe the person, like in my case, you know, my ex had suffered, you know, at least in terms of her story, abuse from her dad and her mom, right? And so there was becomes excuses for the person's behavior, right? Excuses for, you know, whatever they've become inside themselves. And you're like, all right, they're really a good person, but they've had this trauma, they've had these circumstances that have, you know, damaged them in such a way and broken them in different ways. But, you know, deep down, they're a pure soul, they're a good person. That's how people think about it. And at some point, you realize that good person that you originally, you know, was presented to you isn't the illusion, isn't the, you know, the anomaly, the part that was there because of trauma. But it's really the evil side that's the dominant side. That's the true essence of the person. Of course, everyone has a soul and has a spiritual nature. But in terms of who they are as a person, oftentimes it's the dark side of that person that rules. Not oftentimes, but a lot of times. Most people that are fighting, you know, there's a battle between like the good and evil inside of each person. And the same thing with the American system, right? And so when you see something like this, you know, the people who love America, the Republicans who think they love America, the so-called patriots, they'll say it's just Joe Biden. It's just, you know, it's just this Democratic group. But, you know, Trump made all this possible, right? You know, the Republicans made all this possible 
with their military industrial complex. And this has been going on forever. This isn't something new. There's been like an evil, you know, evil basis of the American system going back to the way that the land was conquered and the way that, you know, the indigenous people were treated or the slaves were treated or any of these things, right? That there was evil at the root and basis of all of America, what we know as America, right? That there was evil acts, you know, inhumane acts done by the founding fathers and all the, you know, powers that be and the history behind England before that, right? And this has always been a part of America. It's been a part of the British royal family. It's been a part of human history, human beings. They always want to present themselves as the good side, you know, in terms of the American system, but there's always a dark side. And that dark side is the real America, right? <laughs> because without the dark side, you don't get to have the lifestyle you have now, right? <laughs> the dark side of free land, pristine land that was America and free labor in terms of slavery and then wage slavery, which was not free labor, but still the wage slavery made, you know, when you have just slaves, um, you know, it, it's free labor. But when you have wage slaves, they also are customers, right? So they not only work for the system, but they're also customers of the system. So they have two roles, right? They are, you know, they're workers and customers. And they make the system, you know, that much better and stronger in terms of the, you know, the lifestyle. And so I just want to throw that in here because that's a part of my voiceover coming up, that the real America is what we're seeing now. And this thing that just happened isn't the latest in a, a slide down towards evil. It's exposing what's always been there, right? That's always been a part of what America is. You know, the basis of what America is, the foundational building blocks were built on oppression and, you know, abuse and things like this, exploitation of other people and nature itself and subverting and ignoring the divine laws and principles. So I just want to insert this here and let's get back to it. Kim Kardashian cried when Kanye West gave her back her sex tape footage. So when Kanye was present, it wasn't in a deprogramming center, and he was going full Kanye. He talked about how he saved Kim Kardashian further embarrassment. Um, Kardashian's ex-husband apparently flew from New York to Los Angeles to personally get the footage back from Ray J. And he talked about this, right? And Kim and her team denied it. But like he was saying, he did all these things for her. Um, but the episode on Hulu said... You know, when I showed you this, that their son, Saint, saw on Roblox an unseen footage, an ad for unseen footage of the sex tape. And apparently he couldn't read yet. So um says, apparently Russ, who legally changed his name to Ye, decided to West. Apparently West, who legally changed his name to Ye, decided to take matters into his own hands and flew from New York to Los Angeles to personally get the footage back from Ray J. The episode from the Kardashians calling the family into New York hotel room and emotionally telling them that what West did for her. So Kanye flew home last night and came back this morning and I want to show you what he got me. He got me all the sex tape back <laughs> in a suitcase full of hard drives or something. Astro World, World documentary maker says Travis Scott should be in jail. Um, so apparently, you know, there's all this information out there. There's a new documentary. And, you know, these people who died at his concert, and he's married to one of these Kardashians. Elon Musk, an uneasy relationship with the left, explodes over Twitter takeover. Now, it's interesting that he is now the owner of Twitter and, you know, I mean, he's a part of it. He's a billionaire and he's, you know, he's a part of the club. But it's interesting that, you know, Twitter is going to go in a different direction, possibly. And now they have this disinformation network. So some more Alec Baldwin news. Rush shooting investigation. Sheriff says nobody is off the hook while awaiting key evidence. And so that means Alec Baldwin, because he's the only person that anybody cares about nationally 
getting charged for this crime, right? This is all about Alec Baldwin. And so when he says anybody, he says nobody here. Nobody means Alec Baldwin. Uh, and I was talking about this on Instagram. Here he is on Hilaria, Hilaria Baldwin. Rafi broke his arm really badly yesterday playing at the park. You will see him with a cast for a quite a while now, so I wanted to give you heads up. Thank you, Lennox Hill Emergency Room. So grateful to the doctors and all this stuff here. Um, but here he is, you know, being pictured with Alec P. Baldwin with his ghoul eyes, right, with those ghoulish bags under his eyes. And she's promoting him, and here's another picture of him, as the doting father, right? Right now when the investigation is coming to a head, I mean, this is their new marketing strategy. Neither one of them is, well, she every once in a while posts something stupid, which I've covered. She says something, but uh, like they're trying to, you know, minimize their talk about controversial issues and minimize the hate being generated towards the family because of their dopey ways, right? Things that they brought on themselves. Not that I endorse the behavior, but, you know, the trolling behavior, but you know, it exists, and um, who's luckier than me, Alec Baldwin said. You know, but this is how they're promoting him, right? She has other photos here. It's all kids' stuff. There's him with her. There's the family together with Alec being a part of it. And this is kind of a new thing where they're trying to make Alec into a, you know, a doting father to campaign against, you know, all the, the stuff that's about to befall him. So going back to this disinformation governance board, it sounds like it's a board that's in charge of disinformation, right? <laughs> Disinfo campaigns have been a part of the CIA and the, you know, it's not just the CIA, but every government has disinformation agents and disinformation agencies, not only for their own people. You know, every company has this. Every person, you know, has their own sort of disinformation a way of putting out false information, like people's Facebook pages are disinfo, right? <laughs> like people try to present themselves, their Instagram accounts. Every celebrity has a publicist, and the publicist is in charge of disinfo, in disinfo, right? And, you know, fake branding and things, and just being liars. And every government's a part of this. And so one thing that I am aware of that most people aren't, like I have more of a sense of it from homesteading years and years ago and thinking about this and seeing it. Because when the collapse hits, we saw this in COVID. And so, you know, what did people focus on? If you went to the stores and you saw the shelves that were empty, you know, they got some maybe canned foods. You know, there were some things that weren't there, but the main things were like toilet paper was gone, right? Like they went and focused on toilet paper. It was bizarre. You know, like there was some idea of somebody had this idea or some people did. That this is going to be like Russia and there'd be no toilet paper, you know, and they went and they filled up on toilet paper. I showed you, you know, when the gas pipeline was allegedly hacked by hackers from Russia and people were filling up garbage bags, like clear, cheap garbage bags full of gas. Right. <laughs> and then riding around their car with, you know, 50 gallons of gas unsafely packed up in garbage bags where they tied it off with their hands, you know, like, you would, <laughs> you know, certainly not leak proof or, you know, waterproof. And so what you have is people making bad decisions when they're threatened. They panic and their panic is to grab things. You see it looting. You see looting happening in situations where, you know, there's lawlessness. The first thing people do is go and steal things. And, you know, what they don't realize is that's going to bring down the civilization quicker, right? You might grab something, a watch, a, you know, some, I don't know, some foods or something for a temporary situation. But the dependence you have on this system, this is one of my main messages that people don't get it. They don't, you know, you might hear it and kind of understand it, but we're 100% dependent on this system. You know, some of us more than others, 100% for most people. But even if you're 90%, like in the heyday of my family's, you know, milking cows and um, 
Like, for example, we needed hay. We couldn't supply hay in our, you know, on our farm. We didn't have enough acreage and we didn't have the capacity, right? We have scythes. I have some scythes. But I developed, like, I don't want to say carpal tunnel, but a, a muscle in my elbow, you know, got pulled and I was, you know, took about two or three years for it to go away, <laughs> you know? And I bet if I started scything, it would, if I started scything, scything, you know, I was cutting hay with a scythe, it would come back, right? And so, you know, we couldn't have our cows without hay, for example. And so, yeah, our cows were grazing on our grass, but to, you know, retain them and have it be something that we were independent away from the, the system and other people, we couldn't do that. And you can find that in pretty much everything that you're doing on a farm, that some of it comes back to a dependence on the system in one way or another, right? Or dependence on other people, which might be able to be replaced in a village type situation, but in most cases it couldn't. So even people who are growing food and have some survival skills and things, you're always just one bad thing away from or one new problem away from having to run to, you know, Tractor Supply or Home Depot or Walmart or whatever and pick something up, a, a tool or, you know, something to deal with that problem, right? I mean, it happens all the time. And so even people who are growing their own food and have some level of independence from the system are still very dependent on the system. And the only way to not, you know, the only way not to be is to have a big community of people you can trust and people who are, you know, I mean, very few people are trustworthy. And most of these communities collapse. You know, I've seen it over and over again. People put together intentional communities and for whatever reason, shared minded people. And it always ends up in drama and hate and like it's a bad divorce. I mean, it's a difficult situation to be in because people aren't trustworthy and, you know, people aren't clear in their thinking. The communities start off great with a lot of enthusiasm, but, you know, it just breaks down. Like It just does because people aren't trained to it, just like divorce. Like people aren't trained to be married. And so they're not trained to live in a village-based community, a tribal-based community. And so there's always some sort of like cultish leader type of person who, you know, gets corrupted because it just it just breaks down. And one of the reasons it breaks down is cuz the system is there. You know, when you when you can go and go to the store and get better f fruits and vegetable and meat and things than you could grow yourself, then you could, you know, produce yourself. You're like, "Well, why why would why just, you know, we'll just go to the store, right?" I mean, it just becomes something where you always know that you have the system to fall back on. And most people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. They don't think about it because the system collapsing is unthinkable. And when the system shows some vulnerability, because the system is 100% dependent on perception, illusion, disinformation, right? And so when that falls just a little bit, there's a little bit of a, you know, a break in the, you know, the disinformation and the perception of people when all of a sudden they realize that their system that they're 100% dependent on isn't infallible and indestructible, isn't always going to be there for them. They panic and they do things that are just going to expedite the collapsing of the system because other people then panic. Then everybody's like, oh, the system's collapsing and everybody goes, you know, in and tries to grab as many like superficial uh, short-term type of things, you can't even calculate or imagine all the things you're going to need. I mean, people just take water for granted. That's the number one. City water. The system collapses, no water, and most people are using, I think it's up to like five gallons a day, or is it 20, or is it 100? I just talked about this. I should look it up. It's 101 gallons per day per person. Per household, there's 500 gallons a day. Think about that. Like you go to Walmart, you see those five gallon, uh, you ever see those plastic jugs with five gallons of water? Like when we've had, um, we used to do like sort of test runs where we would shut off the power for a weekend and try to live without power. It was kind of, it was good. It's interesting to do that, right? But we used to go through those five gallon, 
you know, it was like one per day just, you know, in terms of drinking water and sometimes more, right? And so that's just in drinking water. But all the other things you need water for, cooking, you need all this clean water. And then, of course, bathing and other things. People are using 100 gallons of water a day. Where are you going to come up with 100 gallons when the city water is shut off? And that's just one thing out of many, right? What are you going to do with your trash? All this stuff that's like, you know, after a while is going to be disease um, producing, right? I mean, one of the things that happened, remember when they, when New Orleans, when all these people ended up in the Superdome because they were flooded out in that, you know, Hurricane Katrina and the human waste because the toilets stopped working, there was no power, there's no water being pumped into the Superdome. So they had these bathrooms and they were just filled with human waste and it became, you know, a a disease fest after a couple of days, you know, 40,000 people, whatever it was, 80,000 people. And so they had no water and they couldn't dispose of their human waste as well as garbage and things like this. And, you know, all the things that your city and things do for you, all the things that electricity does for you, of course, your car driving it, and those things disappear. It's incalculable the effects it's going to have on your life. Things that you, you know, take for granted that all of a sudden, you don't have anymore. And running into a Walmart and looting or your grocery store is only going to make that happen, that nightmare happen so much quicker. That's how people react. And so the the disinformation, the disinfo, yeah, you know, I'm against it. I'm against obscurantism, but I know how people react. We've seen it. We've seen it when the power goes down. Uh, We've seen it in, you know, the power outage, uh, electricity outage. And what are the way people will behave? We see it when, like, there's riots of one way or another. We see it after a team wins a championship and, and the mob runs wild. It takes very little to make people behave like locusts, and they run out of their minds and just do stupid stuff, right? And so the disinformation aspect of this thing, I mean, the fact that the government puts out disinformation, but they're trying to suppress information, you know, to some extent, I understand because people suck. And part of it is the system that's made everything about pleasure, everything about, you know, your egos, everything about small time, you know, the, looking at the, the short term, looking at your immediate pleasures, your immediate desires, and not the long term, what's better for you, your soul, and everything else. This is why I talk about spirituality and focusing on God. Because ultimately, when you connect to God on a deeper level, you live a much more moderate life because you don't need as much material stimulation. But that's something that's been cut off by our system that's completely about the ego, completely about people's, you know, small selves, their, you know, their immediate desires and things, their egos and their selfishness and, you know, gratification and impulse activity and things, immediate gratification, as opposed to, you know, looking at, a spiritual connection with God and your soul and your real purpose for being here and, you know, living with some sort of dignity and an attitude of service and, you know, focusing on uh, the collective and what's best for everybody. And that just doesn't happen anymore. It's been, you know, washed away by the, you know, materialism of our system and all the negative aspects of it, right? The demonic, you know, sort of orientation an anti-God orientation towards reality and the way we live our lives. And we're all to blame for this, our ancestors. I mean, everyone who's gone along with this, right, we all go along with it. But the people who control the system are a little bit more to blame, especially the ones that, you know, sold this scam, this Ponzi scheme, this debt-based usury economy to people, knowing full well it wasn't built to last. The usury system is so flawed And so, you know, it's debt is wealth. It's crazy. It's against everything that reality and the divine laws and the, you know, godly principles are about, right? It's receiving, you know, uh, something for debt, not even something for nothing, something for debt, where debt becomes valuable. And that's like inverted wealth, inverted, you know, goes against hard work. It goes against, you know, all the things you need to do to accumulate something, right? And so everyone gets hooked into that, this imaginary wealth and the lifestyle that goes with it. And then all these things you become, you know, your privileges and things that you 
take for granted and things that you, you know, can't live without. And when the system goes, they go with it, right? It's like you have a criminal friend or a criminal family and you have a great lavish lifestyle, but then the criminal family is either killed or disempowered or, you know, imprisoned and their assets are seized. I mean, what Jojo Magoo said where he was just seizing people's yachts. Now, we don't know if these people are bad people, right? They're Russian citizens. And if they'll do that to them, they'll do it to you. If they just start seizing people's yachts and wealth, does that have anything to do with Russia and the war? Is that something else, right? Are you just going to seize people's lands and their, you know, whatever they think they own? And that can happen. That can happen anywhere, right? The queen can, you know, shut down parliament in Canada, right? (laughs) Like there's these powers that be by these, you know, these elite people, these wealthy people that are structured where they can just take your stuff, governments or whatever it is. They can just take your house. They can just take your property. I mean, it happens all the time. They call you a criminal. They shut off your credit cards. I mean, it's going to be easier and easier as they go to more and more digital currencies where they can erase you. Look at the deplatforming of people on social media. That's a form of just deperson, depersoning a person, right? Getting rid of their ability to communicate and, you know, everything's about the internet and, and people's uh, social media. I mean, it's a big part of everything, right? People network there. It's a part of business. It's a part of your brand. And just to, to deperson somebody, right? And they can take your wealth. They can take your ability to express yourself, almost just disappear you without any sort of legal, uh, any due process or anything like that. They're doing it to people all over the world now. And it's just coming to a city near you. Your pension is going to disappear. Your Social Security is going to disappear. Your things that you're dependent on. And then you're going to sell you a, a lifestyle that is less than you have now, but it's better than the alternative. I mean, that's their plan, but the system isn't going to, I mean, the system's in free fall and that's why they're doing it, right? And because people are so deluded in reality and what they think they're entitled to and how strong and, you know, f- actually how fragile their system is, right? They perceive your the system as indestructible because there's this idea that, well, we can't live without it, so it has to be indestructible, right? <laughs> like that's what people think, right? That's the people's orientation to the world. And so that's the need for disinformation. That's a need for, I've said this before, if everybody woke up in a true way, then the system would collapse because the system is insolvent and it's only being kept alive by our perception. It only keeps on going because we all need it and we all go along with it. Even if we know the debt-based system is, you know, insolvent and doesn't work and, you know, is I mean, it is an illusion. It's a Ponzi scheme. We go along with it because we have no choice. And if there aren't enough people who believe in it, who truly believe in it, then it collapses, right? And so that's what I'm saying all the time. You know, I I put out these videos, but it's not for everybody. And the spiritual awakening is there for everybody. And that also comes with, I mean, at some point, the spiritual awakening is going to lead a person to live a more moderate life and you're not as good a customer. You no longer indulge in the materiality, the, you know, hedonistic, uh, you know, debauchery of the hedonistic material system, right? And so when you stop needing that because you have a deeper connection to God and you don't engage as much with the system and you're not, you know, you have to be a big consumer and you stop consuming, that also brings the system down. And so, you know, eventually it's going to happen, but people are going to rush this, you know, (laughs) I mean, people who are the most sheeple-like and the most, you know, when they realize it's easier for us, right? It's easier for us to deal with corruption and bad news because we're aware of it. But people who really believe all this stuff, I think Joe Biden is a gift from God, like I covered in a video yesterday. People who don't have the capacity to understand the complex nature of our system and they just think oh america is the greatest country in the history of the world and then the information finally slaps them in the face and they realize they are dependent on a system that is evil they realize there's an evil layer to the system they finally wake up they're the ones who are going to freak out because from where they were just buying into the illusion like just living the illusion right and where they'll go in terms of waking up 
is such a huge gap, right? Where all of us kind of know, all right, the system's corrupt, but we have to kind of go along with it because we don't have a choice and it is whatever it is, right? And so that's what's heading. That's what's heading towards us. There'll be a period of time where people lose faith in the system. The sheep will lose faith in the system. And, you know, disinformation will no longer work on them like it doesn't work on the rest of us because their lifestyle will be gone, right? Things that you were dependent on will be taken. And when that happens, you know, there's going to be a sl- like a, a slap in the face of reality, right? So I looked through this movie, Three Days with a Condor. Um, it's an old movie I watched a couple of times when I was a kid. And I had to fast forward it because there's just all these unnecessary dialogue. Like I talked about, I watched an old Warren Beatty movie, The Parallax something, whatever it is. Uh, he was a, a recruited as a hitman and sort of a, um, you know, sort of almost like an MK person. They had sort of this MK program. And I had seen that movie when I was a kid. And there was like 10 minutes where they're just following a briefcase, right? <laughs> like these old movies of the 70s and 80s, they were just way too long. And some of the conversations and dialogue and, and you already know the point, like you don't, it's just overkill. And sometimes it's just like, you know, uh, why, why did you put this scene in the movie? Um, very slow, a little slow moving. But at the end of the movie, uh, the Robert Redford character is a, a, a CIA analyst who is just, you know, analyzing and reading books where there's all this code. People are printing these books with coded uh, information and he stumbles across something and his whole office is killed. And they recently made a, a remake of it with a, you know, a TV show um, that my wife and I watched. Kind of not a good TV show. I've talked about that before. But in the movie, he has this conversation with a CIA guy. And it's about oil, like in war in the Middle East and how they play games. And maybe I'll make a video about this at some point. But he has this, um, this conversation with someone who's, you know, a middle management guy in the CIA. And the guy says, well, we run these, you know, we speculative games that we have. We don't do them, but we don't, we, we run them. But some guy went rogue, some guy, like he talked about the CIA within the CIA, which would be considered the deep state now, that kind of idea. And that there was a hidden group of CIA members who were running this program and they started whacking Americans because Robert Redford stumbled onto this information, right? And he said it was about oil. And then this guy said, well, what about food, right? He goes, if it isn't oil now, it's going to be food tomorrow, whatever it is, right? And this was preceded, and there was a bunch of, you know, video clips of the CIA office was in the Twin Towers. So there was all these things to do with that. Like a video, it's a movie I would have made a video on a couple of years ago, and I still might, but it's, you know, I mean, it's we're so far past that. But, you know, he says he says at the end, he's saying to the guy, that they're doing shady stuff to keep the system going, which is what I say all the time. You know, they're doing things because the system should collapse and they have to grab oil. And, you know, this is before all the stuff happened in the Middle East. This is a movie in the 70s. And then Robert Redford says, well, why don't you ask the people? And the guy says, the people don't want to know. They just want it to fix it. When they show up, they don't have food. They can't drive their car because there's no gas, right? And, you know, they're not going to run out and 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 say, all right, tell us what the problem is so we can all work together to fix it. They just expect the government to fix it. And that's true, right? I mean, that's legitimate. We all know that, that people don't care. We've all experienced it. And when there's a problem like this, they just want the government to make it go away, right? And if they don't, the people are going to flip out and, you know, destroy the system that they're 100% dependent on. And that's going to happen. Like that's, you know, that's already in the works. Nobody can stop that because at some point, they're going to not be able to deliver to you the things that you think you're entitled to. And when that happens, you know, the mob awakens, right? Right now, it doesn't matter what happens or what they say. People are pacified because you have a full belly and you have the Internet. And you have your, your distractions and whatever it might be. But when those things disappear in your medication and things, when there's a disruption in your life and your services and your lifestyle, people are going to just go ape shit and it's over, right? That's, you know, that's the inevitable outcome of this. And so for me, I just, you know, I'm, I'm aware of once that happens, it's really hard to retain any sort of 
quality of life. As bad as this system is and as demonic as it is, once it collapses, things are going to suck, and that's just so we're all going to have to eat it. Whoever's there, whatever people survive that, we're just going to have to you know go through that transformation. I mean, spiritually, yeah, spiritually, yes, we can connect to God on a deeper level. Maybe you know, growing food, being out in nature, we'll, there'll be some great things about it. Will people will be like some people will thrive, and people who don't fit in now and you know have energy and whatever to to work through the the difficult times and the, you know, the planet's going to be close to in, inhabitable as well, right? It's going to be harder to grow food. It's going to be harder to, I mean, the air quality and just, you know, post-nuclear war stuff, it's going to be just more difficult, right? It's not going to be, you know, I mean, it's so much easier. It's a time of abundance now, and that time's going to disappear. And it's going to be a time of deprivation, and that's going to be difficult for people who are all about consuming, consumers who love to consume. And so that's what's waiting for us one way or another, right? And so when you put it in that context, this disinformation thing, you know, the Bureau, I mean, you know, <laughs> it sucks and it's it's evil, but the whole thing's evil, right? It's evil to keep the evil system going. And once the evil system collapses, then we have, you know, that the difficulty of that, right? And that's what we're all waiting for. I mean, whether we know it or not, right? That's the next big phase when the system we're 100% dependent on no longer is, you know, functioning on either, uh, you know, a whole, a whole out collapse or, you know, partial collapse for some people or, you know, whatever it is. And then, you know, seeing how people react and seeing how people, um, you know, either rise up to the challenge and connect to God and, you know, build something better or just spaz out and, you know, loot and, you know, d delve into lower vibrational animalistic criminal type activity because they're butthurt because they've been lied to. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano, definitely pointing for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.